Well, welcome to Stillwaters Church. It is good to have you guys here this morning. I know some of you are visiting from warm Florida. I am a bit jealous, but uh, I'll get over it. Hey, I choose to live in New England. That's my own fault, so I can't complain. But praise the Lord, it is good to be here this morning, especially this time of the year. Um, we know the reason for the season is this Christmas represents the birth of Jesus Christ, our, our Lord and our Savior, ultimately God coming to the earth in the form of a man named Jesus who came and lived and died for us so that we could have eternity. So we can celebrate, we can have joy in our heart. That's the sermon series we'll go through for the next couple of weeks. Obviously, next week is our Christmas service, so I encourage you to be here and, and be a part of that. The children will be singing, so that'll be a wonderful uh, wonderful opportunity. But um, why don't we open with a word of prayer, and then we'll, we'll worship the Lord. Let's bow our heads. Our Father in heaven, Lord Jesus, thank you that we could be here this morning. Father, I thank you for our visitors here this morning. I pray that you would bless them special as they hear the word of God, ultimately hear from you. I do pray, Father, right now that you would remove any obstacles from us hearing you and understanding your word, what you want to communicate to us this morning. Father, we know that our sin separates us from you, and so you've given us a remedy for that. You've told us to confess our sins to you and that you would cleanse us from all of that. And so we acknowledge our sin. We ask you, Lord, please forgive us for our sins committed this day and every day before. And we ask you now, Lord, to have your way in our hearts, that you would open our minds, even though they can be cluttered, with a lot of thoughts of the world and responsibilities and the next thing we're going to do. I pray, Lord, that you'd remove all of that, that we would just set it aside and let you just have your special time with us right now. I pray over the worship time now, Lord, that we would all sing from the bottom of our hearts as we celebrate the birth of your son Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. We're so grateful, Lord, that you came to this earth and showed us how much you love us, for we would know no other way we wouldn't know that you love us if you didn't come to the earth and die for us. Now we know, and we're so grateful for that, and we celebrate that. Father, again, we thank you for this day. We pray these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Let's stand and worship the Lord this morning. I feel like the first verse that I'm about to sing today, Lord, I come, I confess, bow in here find my rest and without you I fall apart you're the one that guides my heart Lord I come I confess bow in Lord, I need you. 
songs to rise to you when temptation comes my way when i cannot stand i fall on you jesus you're my hope and stay when i cannot stand i fall on you jesus you're my hope and stay God above is our good, good Father. I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard the tender whisper of love in a day. It's who you are, it's who you are, 
good father it's who you are it's who you are it's who you are when i'm loved by you it's who i am it's who i am it's who i am pastor will you lead us in, in prayer oh father i just thank you so much what a special day what a special time lord we have so much evidence that as we sing these words, you are a good, good Father. We have the evidence of a God who came and lived a perfect life and dwelt among us so that we could see how much he loved us. Thank you, Father, for we have, should have no doubt this morning that you love us, for you died for us. Yes, Lord. And because of that, we get to be with you forever and ever once we leave this earth, that our lives will go on forever. We don't have to fear death. Mm, nor the death Jesus. of our loved ones if only they would believe that you had it, always had a perfect plan for those who are distant from you today Lord and don't know you I pray today would be the day that they would know you and that they would enjoy the comfort and the courage and the peace that comes from that relationship <laughs> Father today the enemy works hard to distract us consumes us with worries and doubts and fears I pray, Lord, today that all of that would be destroyed so that the truth of who you are and your perfect plan would be made known to them today. And, Lord, we need a reminder. I need a reminder this morning of the intense love you have for me and for all those who are your children. Yes, Thank you, Lord, for this special time. We give it to you. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. sing you're perfect you are perfect in all of your ways you are perfect in all of your ways you are perfect in all of your ways to us so help us to trust you you are perfect in all of your ways you are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways to us. Amen. He's perfect. He's awesome. His way is always the best. And he loves us. I've heard about this baby boy who's come to earth and bring us joy. And I just want to sing this song to you. It goes like this, the fourth, the fifth, the mighty fall and made you lift with every breath of singing. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Expecting child, they searched in to find a place for you were coming soon. There was no room for them to stay, so he that made you filled with pain, God's only son was born. Shepherds left their flocks by night to see this baby wrapped in light. A host of angels led them all to you. It was just.
just as the angel said, you'll find him in a manger bed, Emmanuel and Savior, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. A star shone bright up in the east to Bethlehem, the wise men three came many miles and journey long for you. And to the place at which you were, their frankincense and gold and mud, they gave to you and cry out, hallelujah, hallelujah. Baby boy will grow to be a man and one day die for me and you. My sins will drive the nails in you. That ragged cross was my cross too. So every breath you drew us, hallelujah, hallelujah. All right. Thank you, Matoko. Wonderful worship again this morning. So good that we could sing to the Lord. When we sing to the Lord, we're saying thank you that you brought us here, that what you've done in our lives. You're acknowledging God for who he is. So important that we do that. And I'm so grateful for all the little kids. They're going to go on back now and have some fun playing. Amen. All right. Let me just give you some quick announcements and then we'll jump into the Word of God this morning. Don't forget next week, December 22nd, is actually our Christmas service. Um, we're going to have the kids up front here singing before the service. They'll sing a couple of Christmas songs together, some Christian Christian songs. So that'll be a good opportunity to take pictures and we'll be recording that uh, for the website. So look forward to that next week. Also, um, next week after the service, uh, don't forget we have Stillwater's Church down in Revere, uh, where we started the church. Um, down there, we're having a fellowship dinner uh, for Christmas. Uh, that'll be from 12 until 4, so anytime you can show up, um, there'll be tons of food and fellowship and music, and it should be a very fun time to spend time with our brothers and sisters down at the Revere uh, location. Um, if you are interested in going, please sign up on the sign-up sheet on the table in the back. And uh, you can go ahead and, uh, if you'd like, you can put down something you'd like to bring. Um, it will be a potluck opportunity. Um, but such a special time of the year um, when we come to Christmas, and I'm looking forward to all the joy that accompanies that and the family time and just such a wonderful time of year. And, uh, but I also remember that isn't true for everyone. Sometimes the uh, holidays can be a difficult time due to loss and sometimes fragmented families and different circumstances. So I just want us to all be in prayer that 
that we could just focus on what Christmas is all about. Regardless of what's going on in our lives outside, uh, we can always remember inwardly, we remember that this is the time we're acknowledging the birth of Jesus Christ, a little baby coming into the, into the world. Um, his name was Emmanuel, which means God with us. In fact, that's exactly what happened. That baby who was uh, conceived through virgin birth, which we'll talk about this morning a little bit, came to the world, ultimately God in the flesh. God came to the earth and wanted to show you how much he loved you. And he came to live this beautiful life of love, and he died for you and me on the cross of Calvary. If he never came, if, if he never came, number one, there'd be no Christmas, right? Because Christmas is about Jesus Christ. But more importantly, if God never came to the earth, we would have no way of knowing how much he loves us. We'd have no way to know. But we do know because we find out that God came himself to the earth, lived a perfect, sinless life, and then died on the cross for us, taking all of our penalty, all of our sin, all the judgment for our sin on himself, and allowed it to be judged and put to death. He took our place. We were supposed to go to the electric chair. We were supposed to get that lethal injection. But Jesus said, I won't have it. I want them to be free of that judgment. All they have to do is believe in me, that when I died, all of their sin was paid for. And so, with that knowledge, we can celebrate Christmas, regardless of what's going on in our lives. I come from a, a background of a family where there's a lot of hostility on holidays. In some cases, I didn't look forward to Christmas dinner, Thanksgiving dinner, because of the animosity that was often at our family table. But what was always in my heart since I was a little boy is that I knew that ultimately my family was the family of God, and that God the Father, the good, good Father we heard about this morning, he was the one who was ultimately my father and that loved me and that he had a plan for me to be with him forever. So there is a way to be joyous even if there is no j happiness in your life today. It's not based on your external circumstances. It's not based on if you have the house you want, the money you want, the health you want, the relationships you want, the job you want. It doesn't matter because the Bible says that this world is going to pass away. It's but a vapor, it says. It's referring to when you light a match and that flame goes out and there's that short moment where there's a little bit of smoke. It's very quick. It's gone. And that's what this life is going to be. Every one of us will stand before God one day and we will stand there as his son or daughter of love who trusted in him or we'll stand before him as a rebellious child or son or daughter who chose to not know him and love him. So let's pray that God would work in all of our hearts this morning. I do want to say on the outset, before I even start beginning preaching this morning, and we actually pray, if you have any questions about the sermon after I'm done teaching, please don't hesitate to come and ask me. Some of the things we'll talk about this morning might be foreign to you. You might say, I never knew that. Is that true? You may have other questions about God and the Bible. I'm here. I will stay as long as you want. You can ask me any question that's ever been in your heart about God or the Word of God. And I will stay and I will show you the truth. And I promise you, you will leave here confident, comforted, strengthened by the truth of the word of God. You're going to learn some wonderful things this morning about how much God loves you and I'm looking forward to it. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Father, Lord Jesus, now in this important moment, in this important season, we come before your word and we really want to hear from you. I would only ask, Lord, that you'd use my voice Use my heart. Use your truth to come forth from me. But ultimately, everyone in this room, and myself included, because I need to hear from you too, Lord, this morning, that you would speak to each one of us and meet us right where we're at, right now in these circumstances of life, and meet our need for the truth. Help us to hear you. We need you, Lord. We need you so desperately. Come, in Jesus' name, amen. As I discussed uh, this week um, and next week, we'll have, go through just a little mini-series uh, called The Joy Season, and uh, I've entitled this morning's message, Jesus, My Joy. Jesus, My Joy. I wanted to ask you a question this morning. Are you filled with joy this morning? Well, God's Word will remind us why we should be. 
Some wish it could be Christmas every day. Why? Some it's the excitement. I know a lot of people love Black Friday. Kind of sounds <laughs> bad, right? Black Friday. I love Black Friday. But it's a time when people go out and they go shopping and buy things for people that they care and love and get that, just that, get that special thing for them. Then for others, <coughs> it's a time for family, time to be together with people you don't get to see all year. People travel and come and see family and spend time together. A lot of people love the anticipation of Christmas time. It's such a great anticipation and joy and excitement. Some people like the food. How many people like the food? I love the food. Uh, it's just a time for us to, to have the best recipe comes out. I know in our home we traditionally have a little bit of Italian food, uh, maybe a ham too, uh, but we have some nice medicottis, you know, pasta with cheese in the middle. I mean, who, who, could, I know, who, could, who could not like that? Um, but some, they wish it could be Christmas every day because they could have that food. A lot of people like the time off. I know for me it's the perfect time of the year to just take some time off and spend time with family, and I enjoy that time. But for the Christian, there's another reason why we should love Christmas. For it's a time to focus and be reminded. A time to celebrate our God and our Savior, how he miraculously came into the world. And why did he come? That's a big question. Why did he come to the world? Why? The answer is to open up a way for us to be with him forever. That's the only reason why God came to the earth. He didn't come to show off, although he could have. He didn't come to look good or to be some heroic figure. He came to open a way for us to be with him forever. If God didn't come to the earth, there would be no way for us to know him and love him forever. Nor would we know his love. I already said that this morning. That's a glorious reason for the season. So what if God didn't come? What if he didn't come? What if there was no virgin birth? What if there was no mother named Mary who brought forth a child through the Holy Spirit? What if he didn't come? What if he didn't exist? A lot of people live as if he doesn't exist. They live life every day as if life was just, you know, I was born from a tadpole and I just roam around the earth and try to survive like everyone else and maybe I'll have some good things and maybe some bad things will happen. And When I die, I'll go on the earth and I'll just turn into dirt, and that'll be it. But the Bible tells us a different story. It's God's word. God himself created us, tells us a whole other story. And the Bible reveals for us that he came so that we could know he loves us. That's the only way we can know. If you take the life of Jesus out of the Bible, or you take it out of history, then God is just some figure up in somewhere, in the abyss, and he's unknowable, which, by the way, is an, what an agnostic believes. You've got an atheist, doesn't believe there's a God. That's nonsense. There's no such thing as a God. We were all evolutionary created from a tadpole, and everything about us and everything that happens in our life is by chance just scientifically ever evolving, ever evolving. <coughs> but we believe, as Christians, that, that God did come in the world intentionally, <coughs> condescended and became a man, the Bible says, came down from glory and became a man so that we could see what God's love looks like. So we could have the excitement that Mary felt when a baby came into her womb supernaturally. We learned this morning that she became pregnant, never ever laying sexually with Joseph. Now Joseph knew that, and certainly Mary knew that. What's also important to remember this morning is Mary wasn't like, a lot of people think because they, don't, they haven't read the, the Bible, they, don't, they think Mary was in her 30s or in her 20s, you know, that perfect age. She wasn't, she was a young teen. Historically, we know. And so you can only imagine what it must have felt like to know you've never been with a man, but there's a baby inside of you growing. That confusion that must have came into her mind and her heart. 
that something unbelievable was happening in her life, but she didn't know why. And was very fearful of the shame that would be brought upon her in her Jewish culture. It would be thought that she, Joseph, would be the first one to say, I have never slept with Mary. I've never been with her sexually. And yet she's pregnant. What would that, what would that scream? <laughs> that she was an adulterous woman. That she was betrothed to Joseph. That meant she was engaged, but it's not like engaged in our culture. To be Jewish, Jewish betrothed meant that you were promised to be married and that in that time frame it was actually as if you were married. In the Jewish culture, if a woman or a man was laid with somebody else and was sexual, that was adultery, according to Jewish custom. And if Mary was caught committing adultery, she would have been brought to the center of the community. Her clothes would have been ripped off of her. She would have been spat upon and ridiculed by every woman and every man in the community and be shamed. And in some cases, she would have been stoned, put to death for violating such a sacred thing as betrothal. So you can only imagine what was going on in Mary's heart. But God's word will tell us the true story of a teenage girl and what amazing thing God had done in her life. It's a story of great joy. I just want you to think about that for a second. Mary's story at this point, from what I've told you, is actually a tragedy. It's so sad. And a lot of us have past history, and we look at our lives, and if they were end today, they would end with a big question mark. That's it. That's all I did. I was born. I did a few things, had a job, maybe had some kids, and kind of never really accomplished anything in life, and, and then I died. And it seems as though there's nothing good that can come of your life. But I want you to know that here we see what appeared to be the worst situation that any young girl could ever experience of shame and sin. God is going to turn into a supernatural work that glorifies the whole world. And that she will be called blessed above every woman. Why, why is Mary blessed above every woman? Is she special? No, the only thing that makes her blessed above everyone else is that God chose her to be the vessel to bring Jesus into the world, to bring the Savior into the world. By the way, the Word of God will teach us this morning <coughs> that Mary says, I need a Savior. <coughs> there are those in religious societies today that believe that Mary was perpetually virgin. In other words, that she had never sinned and never could sin. Well, that doesn't line up with the Word of God this morning, unfortunately, because she calls Jesus her Savior. That she knew she had to be saved from her own sin. That's what the Word of God says. But let's look at the story. I want you to think about your own life and think about what God is doing in it today. And just know that He can turn any hurt into a victory for Him. Any confusion... Mary's very confused at this moment. She's become impregnated, supposedly by God. And there's a lot of confusion. And there's a lot of questions in her heart. Some of you may have questions in your heart right now. Maybe a lot of things about God don't make sense. You never really understood. God's not going to let them not understand. Thank you, Michael. God's not going to let them, let her nor you not understand who he is. Let's look at the scripture this morning. We find ourselves in Luke's Gospel, chapter 1. And we're going to read it in the Good News Translation, which I recommend if you're not a Bible reader, never read the Bible. <coughs> it's called the GNT. That's the, the Good News Translation. It reads like a book, so you can understand everything that God wants you to understand. So listen to what it says, starting in verse 26. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, now Elizabeth is John the Baptist's mother. Everyone know who John the Baptist is? Yeah, he's the one who gets his head cut, head cut off because he preached the word of God. <coughs> but in the sixth month, Elizabeth, this happens to be Mary's cousin, she becomes pregnant. And in her pregnancy, God sent the angel, Gabriel, 
to a town in Galilee named Nazareth. God dispatches his angel, the messenger, Gabriel. Gabriel is known as the angel, the messenger. Elsewhere in the word of God, he brings a message. Even in the Old Testament, we believe that he is used to bring a message to humans from heaven. And he had a message for a young woman promised in marriage to a man named Joseph, who was a descendant of King David. Her name was Mary. The angel came to her and said, Peace be with you. The Lord is with you and has greatly blessed you. Can you imagine? You're at home or in your, in your car, and all of a sudden, an angel, glowing in all of its power and majesty, all of a sudden appears next to you. How are you going to react to that? Right? I don't know about you. I'm going to be like, huh, I'm going to be scared to death. I'm going to be frightened. I'm going to be, what's going on here? Well, look what Mary happens to Mary. Mary was deeply troubled by the angel's message. That's completely understandable. She's not deeply troubled because she's done something wrong or that she's evil or that she's sensing God's judgment. She's just an angel has appeared to her. And she's shocked. And she wondered what his words meant. But what did the angel Gabriel say to her? He said, don't be afraid, Mary. Don't be afraid. Do you know that God doesn't want you to fear him? He doesn't want you to fear him this morning. I don't care what life you've lived. I don't care if you don't acknowledge him. I don't care if you don't have a relationship with him this morning. I have a relationship with him, and I sinned this last week. In ways that I can think of and understand and know I did, because I know what's right and what's wrong. And sometimes I've sinned in ways I don't even remember and didn't realize I did. In either case, I don't fear God. He's not going to get me. The roof is not going to cave on in on me this morning. Because I know that God loves me. And then I know when Jesus died on the cross, that every sin that I did commit last week has been covered by the shed blood of Jesus. So I don't fear God. And, and God wants, doesn't want Mary to be afraid. So he says, don't be afraid, Mary. God has been gracious to you. What's grace? It's God giving us something we don't deserve. That's what grace is. God's given you something this morning you don't deserve. Life. Life. Did any one of us wake up this morning and give our whole lives to God and worship the king of the universe, of all creation? No, not even me. And so he may have a good case to say, you know what, I've had it with you, Darren. Yeah, you talk a good talk on Sundays, but I'm not really impressed with you on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Not impressed with you. So you're a mockery to me. I'm going to bink, I'm going to take you out on the next bolt I send down. No, that, that isn't at all. God is gracious to me, and he's, God is gracious to Mary, and he says, you will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and you will call his name Jesus, and he will be great, and will be called the Son of the Most High God. The Lord God will make him a king, and as the ancestors of David was, and he will be the king of the descendants of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. You know that's why we can have eternal life is because God's kingdom never ends. And then Mary said to the angel, I am a virgin. How then can this be? You know, God can do things in your life today. And you might say, Pastor, that's really nice that you're telling me that God loves me and he's going to come into my life and he's going to do all these wonderful things for me and that one day I'm going to be in heaven. But I have no clue how that could possibly be. I want you to know that's a good question to ask God this morning. God, I don't understand. Listen to me. That's a good question to ask God, and he has a good answer for you, an answer in which you will understand. Maybe the way I'm going to say it to you this morning, that he loves you, you won't understand. You won't comprehend it. I hope not, but that's possible. You could leave here today and say, I don't understand anything that that guy just said. I had no idea what he was talking about. But I want you to know, if you ask God, that, and you say to him, God, I want to understand how it is that you could have died for me and loved me and care about me, even though I've been living my life the way I have been, not caring about you. I don't understand. Could you explain it to me? Could you show it to me? Oh, I challenge you to do that. I challenge you 
to ask God that question of how in the world he could love you. We'll talk more about that at the end of this sermon. But then Gabriel, the angel, answered and he said, the Holy Spirit, he's going to tell her how it's going to happen. The Holy Spirit will come to you and God's power will rest upon you. For this reason, the holy child will be called the Son of God. There he gives her the answer. He says, the Holy Spirit is going to impregnate you. Does that surprise you this morning, that God could do that? Now, just keep in mind, when you look up in the stars, he made them all. When you look at the earth, he made it all. When you look at every human being, he made it all. The ocean, he made it. The sun, he made it. Is it too much for God to take a little seed, a human life seed, a godly seed, and put it in Mary? Is that too hard to believe? It shouldn't be if you just look at the universe and everything God created. He spoke it into existence, by the way. He spoke it into existence. She asked, how can this be? And the Holy Spirit gave her the answer. He says, God's power will rest upon you. For this reason, the Holy Child will be called the Son of God, because he's his Father, Jesus' Father is who? God, the Father. Remember your relative, Elizabeth. It is said that she cannot have children, but she herself is now six months pregnant, even though she is very old. Listen, she's already gone through the change of life. She's very, very old. But God said, for there is nothing that God cannot do. That's what the angel said. There is nothing that God can't do. Can you try to remember that this morning? There's nothing that God can't do. There's nothing that God can't do. Nothing is impossible with him. Whatever it is in your life this morning, that you need something greater than you, greater than the world can offer, greater than the doctors can perform, greater than your 401k can provide, greater than your estranged wife or wife or husband, greater than whatever you need, there's nothing that God can't do. Nothing is impossible with God, some versions say. Just want to let you know that. I need to be reminded that this morning. I want this church to grow. I want this community to find out about Jesus Christ. I want the people that are in bed right now waiting for the football game are at the supermarket going shopping every Sunday morning instead of acknowledging the God who made the food. I want them to come and know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. I want the fear of death to be taken away from them. I want them to know that God loved them so much he died for them. I want them to see the cross for what it really is. That it was God hanging there dying and saying, I'm doing this because I love you more than you will ever know so that you could be with me forever in paradise. By the way, a place that you can't imagine. The Bible tells us that God is going to prepare a place for us that where he is, we may be also. The Bible, if you study that scripture, it's saying that God went to prepare a place just for you. A place that you will want to be. Just the way you want it. I kind of like that. That makes me think I might be in the most warm and comfortable place I could ever be. Every day. Every day sunny. <laughs> no snow. No shoveling. No alarm clock. Oh yeah, by the way, no more funerals. The Bible says no more death, no more tears, no more sorrow. Never going to be sad in heaven. Why? Because the, Satan won't be there. There won't be any death. There won't be any evil. There won't be any lying. There won't be any jealousy. There won't be any hatred. There won't be any, listen, want. You know how many people live miserable lives because they always want? And even when they get more, they want more. I need a little more money. They get a little more money. I want more money. I want a house. I want a bigger house. I want a car. I want a faster car. <laughs> Never enough. You'll find that out someday if you haven't already. But listen, there's nothing, that's in, there's nothing that God can't do. We just need to remember that. <coughs> and he said, I am the Lord's servant. She said it. I'm sorry, Mary. But it happened to me, may it happen to me as you have said. And the angel Less left her. Notice Mary did not doubt what she was told. She believed. She believed wholeheartedly. Now, easily she could have said, Are you, what are you talking about? I'm going to become pregnant without being with a man. You're telling me that God's going to plant the seed in me and that the Son of God is going to be born in my womb. I'm Mary. Hello. I'm a sinner. 
Why would God want to do anything good in me? You might think that this morning about yourself. Yeah, pastor, this is great for you because you're, you're just a holy man and you're a pastor and you're doing so many good things for God and that's going to be great for you, but God doesn't want to help me. He doesn't want to know me. I've lived a horrible life. I've said horrible things against me. That's a lie. The Bible tells us this, listen, that while we were sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. You know what that means? That while you were sinning, God didn't sit there and go, as soon as you down and stop sinning, then all of my promises of eternity will be yours, and I'll, then I'll love you. When you get your act together, and you start living right, then I'm going to start loving you. Then I'm going to start pouring my blessing on you. Then all good things are going to start happening to you. Then you're going to have peace in your heart about me. No, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that while we were sinning, God sent his son Jesus to die for us. Why did he do that? Because he had hoped that we would see that his love is unconditional. His love is unconditional. We love people today. I'll love you if you love me, right? Isn't that how it works? You do good to me, mi casa, su casa. You do good to me, I'll do good to you. <coughs> but that's not how God is. His ways are much higher than our ways. He did a good thing for us. He saved us. He, he took his, our sin on him so that one day our eyes might be open to say, wow, you did that for me, and I really didn't deserve it. You must really love me, and I choose to love you. You know, I want to tell you a story of a young pastor that was preaching in this, this community, this small village for some time, I do believe this is a true story, by the way, from the way it was told to me. There was a very wealthy man in the, in the village, and the young pastor really thought it would be great if this man, he was, a, he was a kind man, he was a generous man, but he didn't believe in God. He, he was proud to tell everyone he was an atheist. He didn't believe in God. I don't believe in that stuff, you know. I just help people, and it'll be whatever it's going to be. And the pastor really felt for this man, and he frequently would see him on the street or see him in the cafe and see him having breakfast and invite him to church and invite him to church and invite him to church and the man never came until Christmas time came. And a lot of people come to church during Christmas time. Nothing wrong with that. I, I see it as a wonderful opportunity for people to know the love of God. So I don't, I don't say to people, hey, nice for you to show up. I would never say that. <coughs> but ultimately, this man comes to church on Christmas. And the pastor just happens to be teaching on the virgin birth. Don't miss this story. It's very powerful. He's teaching on the virgin birth. He tells the magnificent story of how God, the Word, became flesh and dwelt among us. He told the story of how Mary became impregnated by the Holy Spirit and was born into the world to take away the sins of the world. And that that little baby was God in the flesh dying for them. And after the service, the pastor approached the man. He said, I'm really glad you came. Would you mind if I gave you a ride home, walked you home? He said, okay. So he, he went home with the man. He was brave enough to ask the man. He says, well, what did you think of the sermon? Now, mind you, the man's an atheist, so <coughs> that, that was a loaded question. So he asked the man, and he says, what did you think of the service? And he says, well, let me ask you a question, Pastor. What if your daughter came home pregnant, and told you that God had impregnated her. Would you believe it? What if your daughter came home pregnant, by the way, she's engaged to another, a man right now that she's never been with, and told you she's impregnant, but, Dad, I didn't do anything wrong. God did this. God impregnated me. Would you believe her? And the young pastor was quiet for a minute, and he looked at the man, and he said, Yeah, I'd believe her. He said, I'd believe her especially if that child grew up to live and act just like Jesus. I'd believe her. I'd believe her. There's no man on the earth that has lived a sinless, perfect life, but Jesus did. It shouldn't be hard for us. If you've never read the Bible, it kind of sounds like, Pastor, you want me to believe that this girl got pregnant by God? It's not hard to believe when you look what happened to that baby, how it grew up to live sinless, perfect life, did marvelous, amazing miracles, which are an historical account of the Word of God. You know, a lot of people say the Bible's a story, 
I don't know who can believe it. It's been misinterpreted for years, and I don't believe any of that stuff. Listen, if you really want to know the truth, you'll find out that the Bible is a true historical account. It's a, it's a, a history book. It's not a story, a fable. There's history behind this. There's archaeological evidence behind the Bible. It did happen. If you want to study it, you'll find out. And it won't make you mad. It'll make you glad when it's the truth. But ultimately, that man, that pastor gave that man such a wonderful answer. He says, you may have a problem with the virgin birth, but you shouldn't because that baby grew up to be Jesus and died on a cross for the sins of the world. And then, by the way, resurrected. 500 witnesses saw it. And then he went to be with the Father. He was God in the flesh. Now is it hard to believe that there was a virgin birth? Now is it hard to believe that God impregnated someone? shouldn't be hard at all for you to believe that. I love his answer. Let me wrap up. Watch what happens. So Mary gets this news. And Mary says, I really want this to happen. I want this to happen. Soon afterwards, Mary got ready and hurried off to a town in the hill country of Judea. She went into Zechariah's house to greet Elizabeth. Zechariah is the father of John the Baptist. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, listen to this, the baby moved within her. Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and said in a loud voice, You are the most blessed of all women, and blessed is the child that you will bear. Why should this great thing happen to me, that my Lord's mother comes to visit me? She's talking about Mary. I can't believe, Mary, that you came to visit me. You have Jesus Christ in your womb, God in the flesh. For as soon as I heard your greeting, this is what Elizabeth said, as soon as I heard your greeting, the baby within me jumped with gladness. The baby did a backflip in her womb. How happy you are to believe that the Lord's message to you will come true. Elizabeth, listen, the question should be asked, now how did Elizabeth know that Mary had a baby in her womb. She just was impregnated. She didn't walk in with a big belly. She had just been impregnated very shortly before. How did Elizabeth know? It says right here that she was filled with the Holy Spirit. You know how she knew? Because God told her. God told her. Can you imagine Mary, her immediate family, she's, now she's pregnant, but you can't tell anybody because they're going to think she's nuts. And yet she has this truth inside of her heart. And she says, you know what? I'm going to go to my cousin. I'm going to get away from my immediate family because I can't tell them. And I want to figure out what's going on. So she goes and visits Elizabeth. She walks in the door and Elizabeth says, you are so blessed. You have Jesus in your belly. Can you imagine that Mary must have felt peace in that moment? Uh, you know? You know what I know? I don't have to be afraid. I'm not losing my mind. That God has done this amazing thing. And she just, you, you, you know that she experiences this amazing joy in her heart. Remember the message this morning is, Jesus is my joy. The next scripture is a song. She's going to respond with a song. It's called, in the Latin, the Magnificat, which means to magnify. She's going to, She's gonna, her heart is going to explode inside. It's going to explode when she realizes, is this really going to happen? There's no other explanation for how Elizabeth could know this. I am going to give birth. Not only am I going to be a mother, but I'm going to be the mother of the Most High God. It's going to come out of my belly, given from God to me, to give to the world. And this is her response. Listen to the explosion in her heart. Mary said, My heart praises the Lord. In some versions it says, My heart, my soul magnifies the Lord. My soul is glad because God, my Savior. Notice that. Mary recognizes she was a sinner in need of the Savior. She was glad because she, God her Savior was in her. For he has remembered me, this lowly servant. She said, I'm a nobody. And God chose me. Don't think that about yourself this morning. You might think, I'm nothing, I'm nobody, I'm a screw-up, I'm a mess-up, I'm, I'm just a nothing. That's what Mary thought of herself. 
But she was filled with joy because she said, God chose me. I'm a lowly servant. From now on, all people will call me happy. All people. Because the great things the mighty God has done for me. His name is holy. Eight times Mary will recount what God has done for three recipients. Who's the first one? The first one is Mary herself. God has done great things. He's done them for me. Listen, he's done them for you too. God chose me, she thinks in her heart, to love and to fill me with grace. He's my savior. He's my rescuer. These are thoughts that you can have this morning. Did you know the Bible says we didn't choose God? He chose us. I didn't, I, it wasn't me who woke up one day and said, okay, I'm going to acknowledge the God who made me, who saved me. God chose me and put that truth in my heart. Number two, she chooses to show us that God loves us. Verse 50, for one generation to another, he shows mercy to those who honor him. He has stretched out his mighty arm and scattered the proud with all their plans. He has brought down mighty kings from their thrones and lifted up the lowly, that's us. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away with empty hands. That's what God has done for us. We are one of the recipients of this birth. And the third recipient was his people, the nation Israel. He has kept the promise he made to our ancestors. He has come to the help of his servant Israel. He has remembered to show mercy to Abraham and to all the descendants forever. And Mary stayed about three months with Elizabeth and then went back home. Mary's joy is infectious for us today. Her joy is a reminder, a much-needed reminder, that in spite of where we may be today, if we focus in on what is really important, what's most important, if we focus in on our own source of joy, Jesus, who he is, what he has done for you and me, should flood us with a great peace and joy that fills our lives up this morning. If you believe that God loves you so much he died for you and he's done a supernatural work in your life this morning, you could be filled with the same joy that Mary was when she realized that God was going to use her to bring light into the world. Every time someone believes the message of the gospel, what I've been telling you this morning, you become a vehicle of God's light. You became blessed the day you believed when you could go out and tell everyone in the world, My, I'm blessed. Because God lives inside of me. And that I'm going to be with him one day. And that he will make sure that I never thirst and hungry. That he will take care of me. And he will. My life is evidence of that. Many, many others. So here it is. Our joy is rooted in our relationship with God. He is our joy. Last couple of questions this morning. What is God's joy? Would you look at Hebrews 12 too with me? Hebrews 12, 2. Look what it says. Let us keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, on whom our faith depends from beginning to end. He did not give, us, give up on us because of the cross. On the contrary, because of the joy that was waiting for him, he thought nothing of the disgrace of dying on the cross, and he is now seated in the right hand of God's throne. What brought God joy? The cross that was waiting for him. It brought God joy that he was going to die for you and me. Do you doubt that God loves you? You are his joy. That's an important truth this morning. Our joy is in Jesus, is in God, what he did for us. But what's God's joy? We are. That he loves us so much that he died for us. And it, even though the cross would be the only way that he could actually get that joy, once he knew that now there was an open door for us to be with him forever because the sin problem had been solved, that's where God's joy came from. Knowing the joy he feels in having a close relationship with us is our strength. 
That is our strength. Doubt is destroyed. You know this morning that you matter to God. And you could honestly look at the cross now and know how much he loves you. I want to leave you with this challenge this morning as I close. I challenge you to ask God what he feels about you. Some think, I don't want to hear it. I know what he thinks of me. He's mad at me. He hates me. He wants nothing to do with me. I challenge you to ask God in your heart how he feels about you. I think you might be surprised by the answer. He will reveal it to you. I can give you the answer. He's going to reveal to you how much he loves you. And if you ask that question, if you have the courage to ask that question, it will transform your life. Because he is going to answer in a way that you will understand that will blow you away. He may show you in things he's already done for you. He may show you in things that he'll do for you today. He may give you a view of what he's going to do for you in the future. And it will blow you away. And you will fall in love with a God who loves you so much. Because he will make you understand. He does, he's not, doesn't want it to be a mystery to you. He doesn't want you to live your whole life thinking that he doesn't care about you. That he's not aware of what's going on in your life. He knows what's going on in your life. Everything. Matter of fact, the Bible tells, you, tells us he knows every hair on your head. Would you bow your heads with me? Father, I want to thank you so much for your divine plan to bring us all here this morning. I pray that this message of love has been understood and apprehended, that each of us were able to be reminded and for some realize this new truth, that you love us so much that you came to the earth and you died for us. And you used this lowly little girl to be a vessel of that powerful reality. Father, I pray that if there's any doubt in our minds that, that each one of us would have the courage to ask you that question, that we would ask you that question. Please, Father, would you continue to work in each of our lives and as, the rest, as we go from day to day in the rest of this Christmas season, that each of us would grow closer to you Father, I pray for that one or many this morning who are reaffirming their faith or coming to know you for the first time, that you would reveal yourself in a powerful way. Father, I also ask if Satan wants to bring confusion this morning or doubt or fear, that you would defeat him in every mind, in every heart, mine included, that we would never fear you, we never be confused by the love that you speak of. Help us to know you, help us to understand you, help us to live for you. We love you, Lord. We thank you for this beautiful season, which all points to your perfect love for us. Bless us now as we go and protect us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Don't forget.